Hi, everyone. Wow, we have a good crowd. We'll, we'll give everyone a few more minutes to log in. It's great to see so many faces and names popping up. Hi, everyone. If you're just joining, thank you so much for being here. This is uh, was sort of a, a last actually last minute thought to kind of go over the priorities for Autism Day and talk a little bit about the actual day this year. Um, so I'm glad so many people could join us because that tells me there is a lot of interest in the event and just in general in our priorities. Um, in this, um, it's just very exciting. Um, this is our first Autism Advocacy Day back in person since the year before the pandemic hit because we, you know, got shut out the year of the pandemic. Um, and we're coming back with just some serious priorities for the legislature. And, you know, with even some new prevalence data of one in 36 um, that the CDC released. Uh, and an, another piece of prevalence data that we just saw is, um, 27% of those people identified with autism have profound autism. And this is uh, pretty significant because our ask this year really um, is focused on those individuals with the highest needs, which very much includes um, folks with autism and complex challenges. So uh, I think it's just very timely. It's also just an incredibly important time in the budget process. So um, we're hitting the legislature right before the Senate budget is coming out. And we'll talk all about this. So it is a critical time. If you're not going to the Advocacy Day event, that is not a problem. We're gonna talk about the priorities, but also, the, the really important piece here is going to be the follow up. Um, so if you're not there that day, just being able to follow up with your legislator, um, whether they went, whether they heard the priorities, whether they heard from other constituents, and then really voicing your, um, your requests. And all right, it looks like we have a huge group. So I'm going to just jump right into my slides. And it it's a, might be a little bit longer today than our usual half hour. Um, but feel free to jump off if you need to. And um, let me get my slides up here. Okay, there we go. All right, so just, um, I didn't mention this before, but if people don't know um, about Advocates for Autism in Massachusetts, they are the group that runs this Advocacy Day every year. Well, every year, even during virtual years. And um, they are a real partner to the ARC and we've been collaborating with them for a very long time. Um, and uh, they actually are made up of, they're a, a full-blown advocacy organization made up of 13 member organizations across the state and um, representing a whole lot of voices and um, a whole lot of membership. So uh, we're really happy to be collaborating with them, obviously. So let's just get to what we're going to talk about today. Um, I am going to take a minute to just talk about the logistics of the day and the agenda um, and the theme of the event and why we, why we chose this theme and the importance of it. Um, and that leads really into understanding our priorities or our, our ask for the day. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about your role in advocating with your rep and senator or their staff. And then the importance again of, of follow-up and we'll take time for some questions as well. But Kathleen is um, actually monitoring the chat. So if you have a burning question or I make no sense to you on a slide, please stop and uh, put it in the chat and she'll tell me. All right, so some of you, this is, you know, old news. You've been to the State House a million times. You don't need this uh, reminder. But just in case, um, most people do park at the Common Garage, and it is a 10-minute 
10, if you're a quick walker, 10 minute walk up the hill. Um, but if you need a little more time, plan for that. And, um, uh, you know, some people, I don't know, the common garage, Charlie, is it still 28? I always forget. $28 pretty much for a half for that amount of time or a little less. He's trying to unmute. Um, I plan on that. It's, for some people, it might make sense to, to try an Uber. I, I don't know. Um, you know, that might be cheaper and easier, um, especially if you have any mobility issues getting up that hill. But my advice is to definitely arrive early. Um, it does take time to walk up the hill, but then also there has been, we're noticing more and more, a little bit of a line forming outside. Um, and the state house actually doesn't open until nine, um, but our registration opens at 930. So I would kind of recommend trying to get there by nine. I know that seems, um, it does seem a little bit early, but if the earlier you get there, the, the more chance that you won't have to wait in a long line and you'll be right on time for the event. So once you get through that line, which includes security, and just as a reminder, um, if you can put everything in your bag and put it through the scanner, it's a lot easier Then you'll just be able to walk through the security um, scanner yourself without any issues. So just put your phone, put your, you know, pocketbook, everything in, in a bag and, and it'll go through smooth. Um, and then we are actually, when you get through the, the scanner, you'll go to the left. Um, we will have a guide there to kind of direct you, but you take a left and then you're going to go to the first set of elevators and, and take them up one floor to the second floor. Um, from there, you're going to take a right and we'll have guides there, but just in case they step away for a minute, um, you're going to go straight down the hall and you'll see the great hall of flags. You'll see the registration table um, and we'll have some signage up as well. So you'll check in there, get your folder, and you know it's it's great to mill around and and talk to people. But if you're someone who really uh, might struggle with hearing, uh, get to the front of the room and get a good seat because the acoustics. I don't know if I spelled that right. The acoustics in the room are are kind of tough. Um, so sitting up front, if you you know really want to be able to hear well, is is a good idea. Um, and then we'll just sit back and enjoy when you're there. And so not being late is important because uh, this is the year we have a Governor Healy attending, which is really fantastic news. She was um, you know, really excited. We met with her team and she said, this is just an incredibly important um, you know, issue for her. And she is coming right at the top of the hour. So, um, you know, get right, you know, we're going to start right on time for her <laughs> so that we don't keep her there too, too long. Um, and then we're also going to have a, a, a big announcement. So we, we definitely want everybody there early. Um, we do have amazing MCs. People might remember having Heather Hedges, uh in the past. And um, this year we have Reggie Williams, who's also done it in the past for us virtually, but never in person. And, and he's an incredible self-advocate. And of course, Heather is has been um, a, a, a long time supporter of AFAM and she is a parent of a, a young child with autism and has been the on air anchor for Boston 25 for a long time, but she just recently left that, um, which actually frees her up to do a little more advocacy, which is great because she's going to really jump into that. Uh, it's very exciting. Um, and, and then we have a, a really wonderful senator this year to honor. I mean, I just hope everybody really gets behind her. Um, she's done so much uh, for the autism community and she can, she's in leadership at the State House, Senator Lovely. And um, I just can't say enough about working with her, working with her staff. Um, and she's also very personally tied to the issue. Um, being an aunt of two individuals with autism um, who are actually kind of living the issues we're talking about here um, today around the lack of services and um, day programs and, and other things that are impacting her family as well. So um, it's she's a great connection for us. And then we have amazing speakers um, that are going to speak to the workforce 
I don't know if it's a crisis anymore. We're, we're, we're really calling it a, a systemic failure at this point um, because we know uh, the impact on thousands of individuals in Massachusetts. And um, they will we'll have a parent speaker, we'll have a provider speak. Um, and then we have a, a, a nice uh, speaker that's going to talk about our ABA pilot that we did this past year. And it was a small pilot. Um, but it was uh, providing it, the legislature actually passed this um, this amendment to allow us to do the pilot. So we thought it might be nice to give them sort of an overview of the outcomes. And um, and it was a small pilot for for three day habs who provided ABA to adults with autism. And this um, is not something that is currently uh, in law, but it is a bill that we have prioritized. So um, he's going to speak to that. And then I'll be talking about our, our budget and bill priorities and a call to action. And then um, Michael uh, will wrap things up. So that's kind of the day. Um, for you all, it would be fantastic if you could take time after the event to go by your rep or senator, both actually, his office. Um, if you haven't, reached out to them to see if you can actually get an appointment. It's not too late. It's Thursday. You can still reach out. Very doubtful that you'll see your rep or senator um, for that appointment, but that's fine if you haven't made an appointment um, and staff has time to meet with you. Uh, take it for sure. Um, the staff is really key and getting to know them and having them understand our ask is, is really um, important. So um, so there's help available if you leave the Great Hall and you're like, where do I go? Uh, we have maps, we have um, we have directories that are uh, that will tell you exactly where your rep is or senator. And um, but if you don't know the building, definitely ask because you don't want to just get lost wandering around in there. It's pretty confusing uh, the way the floors are set up. Um, but bring your folder, you'll have a folder that you'll get at registration and that will have our ask in it. And you can talk that through with, with your representative. If you don't have time and getting here was as much as you could do um, on the morning of Monday, that's fine too. Definitely just use this as a springboard to follow up with your rep and senator, ask them if they attended, um, you know, ask them if they got the ask and really push um, what we need them to do, which we'll go over, but really we need their, their co-sponsorship of our bills. Um, we need them to support the budget and, and any budget amendments that come from AFAM or the ARC um, and, and lots of follow-up on your part. You know, I, I, I did hear someone say the other day and I empathize. She said, oh, you know, I, I wrote to my rep and I never heard back. I got a, a canned email back. And I was like, oh, damn, you know. But then I thought about it. And I was like, we may need to reach out three or four times. You know, they need to know that this is really important to us as constituents. So reaching out once says it's important, but reaching out more than once um, is, is a way you're more likely going to get a response. And I know it feels hard to do that sometimes it's like it's a personal issue and you really want to feel validated when you reach out um we talked about that yesterday Jen Drohan um but uh but you know get tough and keep asking and and you will get a response um okay so our theme services and supports can't wait uh, I think everyone probably on this call has heard about the estimated 3,000 people who are currently not receiving day programs, um, and some are in mass health day programs or CBDS, um, and they have not been able to attend for up, up to three years. And some of the folks are individuals who turned 22, but never got any day services. Um, and a lot of that has been dependent on their level of need. And if they have high needs, um, they are the ones who have been left behind. And you know, this is a real inequity for us to make sure that every legislator and the governor hears over and over. Um, and it really is a, a, oh, I see a, a hand up, Andrea. Mara, the, out of the three, 
thousand, right? So, so the, is this specifically of folks with autism? Oh or no, is it autism? no. So it's IDD. All right, it's so, the whole group. Yeah. So I, I know you just mentioned some of them that had turned twenty-two. Do we know how many of the three thousand? And maybe I should know this number, but no. um, are folks that had services prior to the the pandemic and then have not returned? We don't. I don't have a. No, a lots breakdown. of estimates okay. that keep flowing, floating around. But, yeah. um, you know, we know for a fact that, uh, well, this year we had, what, 1,400 uh, new graduates and yeah. somewhere around that number for the last two years, a little bit less each year back. Um, and we know that at least 20% of those folks have really high needs. So yeah. if you start to kind of do the math, um, and, you know, some providers have done better and really been able to bring back those high need folks. So, but it's part of our ask is to say, let's jump in, figure out who, you know, keep figuring out who these individuals are and let's do some workarounds because whether we make an impact on the workforce crisis this year or next year, uh, nothing's moving fast enough for these families who have already been suffering um, in these individuals. So um, that will get a little bit more into that. Yeah, um, it's still a huge number, regardless of what the, um, you know, how it breaks down. But I just was curious. Thanks, yeah, Mara. I, I would love to get the breakdown also by diagnosis. It would be interesting to see if yeah. um, we have a higher number of people with autism. Well, it, it's likely that we have a lot of folks with um, behavioral issues that need one to one that have not come back and then people with really medically complex. So it's probably a little bit of a balance um, or and some of those of course have autism and they're medically complex. So, um, so yeah, so, you know, the, the, our, our first order of business is to get the rates of pay increased. And I mean, that's a first step, but it's really important. There's many more things that need to be done to affect this workforce crisis. And we know that. Um, but what the legislature can do right now is help us increase those rates. Um, and then what can be done for those folks who are at home, who are struggling with, you know, one day a week of services or two days or no days or no transportation, um, families who cannot work, who haven't been able to return to work. Um, the economic impact on them is, is serious and, and we want we want people to react to that. We want the legislature to really push DDS to do as much as they possibly can with the FY23 um, budget and language that passed that says, let's, let's do that. Let's focus on those who don't have services and let's get creative around how we can serve them. But I'll talk more about that in another slide. Um, but then the other ways we're going to turn the tide is through some of our legislation. And we'll go into each of these. And everything I say today is amazingly on a one sheeter that you will have in your in your folder. So it goes through our budget ask and it talks about our bills. And we even got to add in um, the House budget amendments that were passed that we're looking to get through on the Senate side. Actually, there's only one. Um, so all of this is, is, is there for you informationally in the folders. So I know so many of you have been on my webinars in past Thursdays, so this is going to be a little bit of a review. But I think just going into the day, it's good to have the balance of where we're at. And we really do have good news on the budget. I mean, it's, it's a lot of money in mass health for day programs. It's going to make a very substantial increase already. Um, if this passes through and the governor signs it and there are no vetoes, um, we're, we're really looking at seeing rates for uh, those workforce within mass health day habilitation to really go up a lot. Um, so maintaining that 200 million is so important. And I think when I've been doing my webinars in the past, we've been a little bit breezing over the maintenance and focusing on you know, the increases that we want but um, you know, April's revenues have come in and they are way down for the first time in years for Massachusetts. So it sort of uh, triggered me to think more about 
making sure that the legislature understands that they cannot cut these line items. Um, and 200 million is a lot of money and we don't wanna see even 50 million cut from that. We need the full 200 million. Um, and so the other good news is that the house maintained all of these increases. So they maintained the 200 million for mass health day programs and they maintained all of the DDS line item increases. So we have a lot to be grateful for. And um, so it's gonna be a mixed message at Autism Day where we're saying, thank you. We, we really appreciate this budget, but now let's talk about those folks that are unserved in this unbelievable workforce crisis that is with us for years to come and how we're gonna impact it. Um, so you can see some of the increases here. I won't take too much more time, but good news for adults with autism. We got the 10 million, um, more money in family support and a huge increase in residential. So, um, and that's just the overall line items. Um, and at the very bottom, you'll see the chapter 257 increases. And again, we're asking for maintenance of that increase. It doesn't look like an increase from last year here, but those of you that have been with me in the past, you realize that last year's money was for a different set of rate increases. And this year's money is actually focused on day programs. So it's a, it's a smaller number, but it's still an increase. So we're happy to see that. Um, so maintenance of all of this is super important. Okay, so now we'll talk about the ask. Um, so we wanna see on top of Governor Haley and the House budget, an additional 5.6 million in our community day and work line item. Um, this is for those who need to come back with one-to-one -one supports. So it's really focused on um, how do we get those people back? here's some additional money for the providers to go ahead and do that. So this was an amendment in the House budget um, and it did not pass. So we're gonna refile this amendment on the Senate side. And if it passes on the Senate side, then it will go to conference and we will fight hard for it in conference. So um, we'll talk about the timeline of the budget in another slide, but you know this is coming up very soon that we will be again putting out action alerts for our um, for mem for Senate members to support the amendments that we file have filed. Um, okay, so I think everybody knows. So outside of the budget, we're looking to increase the workforce rates in chapter 257 through legislation. And I think people know about the workforce bill that was filed by uh, Senator Feingold and Rep Garbley and Rep Cataldo. Um, so that's separate from the budget, but still a real high priority ask. And, um, and then maintaining that 200 million once again. So you'll see also on the ask that we are asking to repeat the FY23 bridge to the future language and the transferability. And um, I've gone through this before, but for new people, it's really about reaching those folks who are at home or um, even folks who are in uh, residential settings but are not getting to their day programs. How can we reach them? And um, how can we be a little more creative how can we stipend family for what they're doing for in-home uh, care and desperately trying to get community services and, and um, options for their loved ones? Um, and so, you know, this is a really important piece. It's not a clear ask, it's not a money ask, but there's money in the budget to do this. So we wanna use that money. Um, so, and then the transferability, I, I put it twice, I guess. Um, this is when we have an underutilization in one line item, and we want to be able to transfer that to another line item that needs it or needs it more. Um, and I think this is really important based on where do we go with this workforce crisis if we start bringing folks in? And all of a sudden, we have a lot of people coming back, thousands of people able to come back. Um, we may need to add money to transportation, or if we still don't get enough workforce back, 
can we take some of that money from uh, from one line item and bring it back to family support or another area? So the transferability is important. The implementation of that transferability is even more important as we're seeing this year, because last year there wasn't a whole lot of that, even though it was allowed. So um, I know that's a little bit into the weeds, but it is on your sheet and you'll be able to, you know, just give them the sheets too. And they can always follow up staff, follow up with me. It's on my, my emails on the fact sheet. All right. This is just an overview of where the budget is. So, you know, we, we made it through house ways and means house debate, <laughs> house budget. And then we know that, um, the Senate budget is is likely coming out on Wednesday of this week. I think I already said that. And then Friday we will have our amendments due. So you'll see um, you'll see some analysis come out on Wednesday. We'll hurry, hurry, hurry to get as much support as we can for a few amendments um, through the Senate, and then they'll file those on Friday. And we'll we'll hope for the best and keep on plugging away with our with our senators. Um, so this is the workforce uh, legislation we talked about, and it will increase pay for DDS and for Mass Health. So it's a very interesting bill. It's bringing um, workforce up to the 75th percentile of BLS, Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, and that's a going to also likely be a significant jump if we can get this legislation through. Um, it will also be a continuous uh, increase as the BLS shifts, and hopefully that means it will always increase. Um, so this bill is really well supported right now. We're partnering um, AFAM, uh, the ARC, and ADDP all supporting this bill, which is great. We have, I believe the last time I checked, 87 co-sponsors on this bill. Um, which is great. But if your representative is not on the bill, um, you can remind them this is a critical time. And if they are on the bill and you ask them to, to co-sponsor and, and they're already on there, that's okay. It's fine. Just have them double check and, and thank them. Um, and we do have other legislation focused on the workforce. It want, the second bullet here, legislation to provide community colleges, actually not on the one pager, but the parent guardians as paid caregivers is. So it's something you can hand them and talk about, especially if this is important to you. Um, if you have a story around this, if you are really behind parents and guardians being able to be paid as PCAs and AFC providers, please share this with your legislator. Um, please also reach out to me because we just found out um, that the hearing for this bill has been scheduled. Um, and I'll just throw it at you for May, is it 15th or 16th? Well, you just gave it just May 16th at 10 a.m. Um, so we need a good showing. This is the first time we've filed this legislation and it's a huge policy shift. So we really need to see a lot of people um, get behind this one. So if you can't be there on May 16th, it's, it's a hybrid hearing. Oh, go ahead, Andrea. Oop, un unmute. Andrea, are you talking to us because you're still muted? Sorry. Um, okay. The May 16th is the same day as the Caring Force rally through the Providers Council. So there'll be a ton of direct care staff at the State House um, mm -hmm. already. So maybe we can um, just add that into the, you know, when they go up to the their their reps' offices to make sure that they. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, think, I hope that there's a lot of parents and other professionals there as well. Um, I don't know if that's who comes in as much for the caring force, but for this one, we're definitely going to want to target some parents who, okay. who are maybe in a position where they would, they are guardians, um, but they would love to be paid caregivers because they're maybe already doing it, right? And they've been doing it maybe for the last however long. Um, other states have passed this. They've done, um, some did extenuating circ circumstances during COVID where they allowed parents to be paid. And others have just outright passed legislation to say, 
why not, if a parent wants to be a PCA or an AFC provider um, and they're a guardian, um, why are we holding that back? So anyway, that's coming up. Sorry, a little off track there, but um, yeah, so that's the bill. And yeah, reach out to me if you have any um, interest or questions about the bill. The other bill that's on the fact sheet for, for AFAM in, um, that you'll see is the ABA uh, Mass Health for Adults. And I spoke a little bit about Jerome Chu, how he is going to um, give us an overview of the, the ABA pilot and the outcomes, which are very positive. Um, even though it was a short pilot, it really showed huge benefits to the individuals that were um, provided these services and increases across the board in, in skill development and um, uh, just a lot of really avoiding, um, you know, emergency rooms, avoiding injuries, less, less self-injury, less aggression, all those good things. So um, anyway, this bill is actually also scheduled for hearing, but not until June 27th. So it gives us a little bit more time, but we would really love to have a great showing here. Um, we kind of do every session, but this is, uh, this is our, I think our third session with this particular bill. So we really want to make sure, um, that we get it through committee and we do have new chairs. Um, so chairs of children, family, and persons with disabilities. So we really want to make sure they understand the need for this bill. And there is often a little bit of opposition around this bill. So really important that we continue to support it. And it is an AFAM priority as well as an ARC priority, but I won't take too much more time. Okay, so if you have not um, done a lot of this advocacy work and you don't know who your legislator is, that's fine. Um, go to the ARC and go click on our advocacy tab and just put in your name and address and it will tell you, even if you think you know who your legislator is and you've worked with them in the past, check because there was some redistricting there's 25 plus new legislators. So you may have actually had a turnover. Um, and then to kind of stay on top of like the budget process and when the amendments are coming in and when these hearings are getting scheduled, which we're gonna put out as much as we possibly can on, on the hearing dates um, soon, uh, sign up for notes from the ARC because we'll keep you informed. And, um, and the social media is really helpful, too, if you follow the ARC on social media. Uh, and those action alerts, right? They seem like maybe they're not so efficient because they're kind of impersonal with the, you know, clicking. But they they really work when we all do them because it, it shows, you know, grassroots. It shows numbers. And it's also a really good way for you to actually learn what the issue is if you read through the letter um, you'll understand the real key points that we're trying to make and you can follow up. And it's a very nice, I like to call it a springboard. So, um, and I think just, you know, to remind people how important your stories are, if you haven't met your rep or senator or their staff, um, it's okay to just kind of give them an overview of your family story and especially if you have an appointment and you've set up time to meet with them, you know, if, if you're just stopping by, you're probably not going to want to go into the whole story of, of your family or your professional stories. Um, but just remember how critical they are in helping uh, our lawmakers understand uh, the, the, the system that we're living in that's kind of complex and really understand the issues we're facing as families and individuals. And um, that's Jess and her uh, brother, Jason, and I forget her other brother's name, but they did an amazing audio um, advocacy effort. And we're sending that out to all the legislature about his struggle to get back into day programs, Jason's struggle. Luckily he's back, knock on wood, it stays, it stays good for them. Um, and let's see, it's, I want to take some questions. So I think almost everybody has heard my my advocacy around direct support, but you know that's my son, Neil, and he needs a whole lot of support and he needs a, a person who is well-trained, 
um, instinctual, <laughs> uh, understands importance of, of timing, of medication, can really manage challenging behaviors, um, work with Neil on communication. There's just so much they need to do. And they obviously are not being paid enough to do this job because the turnover continues. And part of this is training. We also need to pay enough into this field that providers can do more training than they're doing now. Um, training tends to be a reason for turnover. People don't feel secure and good about their, their work. Um, they, they may end up leaving. So um, last thing to mention is the House passed the Operation House Call Amendment, which um, for those of you who don't know Operation House Call, I'm glad to tell you about it uh, offline another time. But if you do know it, it um, we are very excited because the Chair of Healthcare Finance actually put an amendment through that was that is our legislation. So the legislation we've been trying to pass for the last nine years um, passed the House, and it also uh, came along with some funding for the program, which will help us maintain it and grow it, which is very exciting. So we'll see what the Senate does, and we will have to have an amendment on the Senate side. So look out for that if this program is important to you. All right. That was a ton of information. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, and I see some things in the chat, so let me open those up. Oh, thank you. This is great. You're sending the, yep. So if you're registered for the event, you will receive a whole lot through your email. That will hopefully today kind of helped when you look through it, it may, you know, look more familiar and you may be able to digest it a little bit easier. Um, but other questions from my presentation or just questions about the day? I got a lot of people on here who can help answer too. Okay, I guess we did a good job. Um, I'm really excited. I hope everybody can make it on Monday. And if not, um, that you'll just follow up with your reps and senators anyway. And, um, and, and please follow up with me on any of those bills or, oh, someone's got a question. Elizabeth, do you want to unmute? Can I share? This? Yes. Yes, please share. Hi. Yes, sorry. Can I share? Um, so you sh shared with us a Google Drive. Can I share those documents with our um, PACs and everything and our and other people? Oh, my goodness. That would okay. be wonderful. Yes, yes. Okay. Please. Right. Please, please do. And um, do people feel like the slides would be helpful to send along just by email? We yes, I think the slides well. would be great too. Okay. And we did record this. So in case uh, somebody wants to send it along, uh, we can do that too. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. Oh, Evan was one of the first. Wow. 25 years ago. Yes. This program has been a long, around a long time. And um, it's really grown and I, I feel like we're getting some really good support now. Um, so, okay, everyone have a great day and we'll, we'll see you all soon. Take care. <laughs>